It started with a routine call about an assumed break-in, a black suspect arrested, a white police officer presiding. But as the details came out and the president weighed in, the story became much more than that. Our number one story, the continuing debate on race. Tomorrow, President Obama will meet with the Harvard professor arrested in his own home, Henry Louis Gates, and the man who arrested him, Sergeant James Crowley. Meanwhile, the woman who called 911 to report the suspected burglary spoke with reporters today, breaking her silence on the matter. The incident has incident also prompted inflammatory comments from the far right, proving that two weeks after Professor Gates' arrest, there is still much to discuss. Our correspondent is Andrea Mitchell. Hopefully soon we'll be Her call to police unwittingly triggered an incident that has ripped the scab off racial politics in America. The criticism at first was so painful for me and difficult. I was frankly afraid to say anything. People called me racist and said I caused all the turmoil that followed. And some even said threatening things that made me fear for my safety. I knew the truth, but I didn't speak up right away because I did not want to add to the controversy. Lucia Whalen, on a lunch break, called 911 to describe what she saw on that front porch in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I'm not sure if these are two individuals who actually work there, I mean, who live there. You think they might have been breaking? I don't know, because I have no idea. Just the facts, and contrary to the police report, no mention of race. She said today her parents taught her to be kind to strangers. And do not judge people based on race, ethnicity, or any other feature other than their character. But when the first African-American president criticized the police... The Cambridge police uh, acted stupidly. His political opponents, who have huge followings, were off to the races. And to the commentators, at least, it was all about race. This president, I think, has exposed himself as a guy over and over and over again who has a deep-seated hatred for white people or the white culture. Listen, he, he got, you can't say he doesn't like white people. David Axelrod's white. Rahm Emanuel's his chief of staff are white. This, I think 70% of the people that we see every day are white. Robert Gibbs is white. I'm not, I'm not saying that he doesn't like white people. I'm saying he has a problem. He has a, this guy is, I believe, a racist. Fox News said that was Beck's personal opinion. But then there's Rush the Limbaugh. To remain a race. Let's face it, President Obama's black, he's, he's, and, and I think he's got chip on his shoulder. This is happening while right-wing bloggers and talk radio hosts are also challenging whether Barack Obama is even a natural-born American, ignoring all the evidence that he is. Their underlying reason, many say, the president's race. So even though Barack Obama's election was a milestone for the country, we have a long way to go. It isn't quite post-racial. We still have conflicts between African-American citizens, especially males, and the police department. And we shouldn't wave that away or anyway minimize that kind of problem. I brought Raising the question whether we live in a post-racial America in life or politics. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, Washington. Joining me now is the Pulitzer Prize winning, column, winning columnist for the Washington Post, Eugene Robinson. Good evening, Gene. Evening, Governor. Gene, I had two African-American roommates when I was in college in my freshman year, the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated and Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. It took us a year to listen to each other's narratives, understand each other's narratives, and begin to trust each other. And today we're still friends. How can we possibly hope that this problem is going to be solved over a beer in the White House. <laughs> well, it's not. It's it's not going to be, Governor. It's, it's it, You know, we've been working on race in this country since 1619. It is now 2009. So, so it's it's not going to happen over one beer. But this is how the discussion happens, I think. We, we, we say we would like to have uh, a full and frank and comprehensive discussion about race in this country. I've written that, I've said that, but I've come to realize that 
that's not going to happen. We're not all going to sit down in a in a classroom. We're not all going to be able to to sit in the same dorm room and 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 exchange narratives in that way. But what happens is an incident uh, like this one happens, uh, and it's and it's an incident with a lot of layers and a lot of levels and a lot of angles and compelling personalities. And in this case, we're fortunate uh, an incident in which the only thing, the only feelings uh, and dignity got injured, uh, but no one was hurt. There's, there's no tragedy that we have to talk about. But it's a compelling story. We look at it in different ways. And and at the heart of it are unprovable propositions. I believe that if a white professor had been involved, there would not have been an arrest. Others don't believe that. I cannot prove it unless I can get somebody like Larry Summers to to participate in, a, in an experiment for me, and we can see if we can run it. But but it's, it, these these propositions are unprovable, and so we talk about it, and we're really talking about our own feelings and our own experience of race and well, our I own prejudices, and it's a good conversation. In many ways, that's the whole point, though. Uh, we've got to get people to listen to each other's feelings. It, it, you know, maybe there's racism here, maybe there isn't. I think most of us are now inclined to believe that maybe there wasn't, but no matter what, it's, it's not whether there was or wasn't racism in this particular instance. It's you have two reasonably well-respected people, one very well-known, one not so well-known, who have different narratives behind their whole history that cause this kind of problem. How can we get at those narratives? And how can we listen to each other's narratives so we can understand each other? Uh, well, we can put them out there. And, you know, we can't make people listen who don't want to listen, who aren't of a, of a mind uh, to listen. But, you know, I, I'm writing about it. Others are writing about it from different points of view. I do not believe that the, 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 the flamethrowers like Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh are con constructively contributing to the conversation. But I do think um, enough people are paying attention to the story uh, that, you know, again, you don't get all the way there uh, on one story in one week, um, but but I, I guess I'm optimistic because I just think this is such a multi-layered story in which you have not just race but class and power and and all sorts of things that have been happening in our society uh, that make it different from what it what it was one of the most 20 or 30 things, years ago. One of the most interesting things to me about this was watching President Obama, who has really been above the racial tension in this country for a long time, for the first time he seemed to kind of go into the narrative of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the black community, the black male, who was historically and has been historically uh, the target of abuse by white police. And we think that, I think it's getting better. I'm an optimist. But it was so interesting to see the president of the United States of America say that, re realize he shouldn't have said it, and now react by trying to get the conversation started in a constructive way. Governor, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't believe I know a, a personally know a, a black man in this country who uh, who, be, who does not believe that race was somehow involved in the in, in the fact of the arrest. Who, who believes that um, all other things being equal, had it been a white professor, an arrest would have taken place. I you know I'm sure there may be people out there who do, but it, it, and, and again this comes from history. It comes from experience it is not provable but it's it's strongly um, it's a strongly held belief Gee, is, there, is there anything to be done about the kind of I mean you could laugh at Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh but they are inflaming things and making them much much worse yeah. other than yeah. being punished at the polls which they clearly will be by the under 35 generation that elected Barack Obama in the first place what do you do about that because it's not just harmless stupidness it's it's a really it's dangerous incitement it is it, it is dangerous incitement, and I don't know what you do about it because I'm, I'm not a believer in in some sort of new fairness doctrine. I, I you know I believe in free speech. I believe uh, that there is a marketplace of ideas, and 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 rotten putrid ideas ought to uh, you know ought to um, uh, ought to be discarded. Um, uh, but but I take your point. It is it, it is a problem. Here's here's one thing I, I I've been curious about. Where are the principles? conservatives who, who believe in individual rights, who oppose uh, intrusive police 
power, for example, or the abuse of police power. Wouldn't it be smart politically for a few conservatives to come out and on the side of Professor Gates and say, you know, he may not have acted well, but the man was in his own house. And well, the if, they ever, that, if, and if the Republicans arrested. are ever going to ever going to recover, they're going to have to learn that. Eugene Robinson, Pulitzer Prize Will Econom Will, uh, winning economist of the Washington Post. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. And that does it for Wednesday edition of Countdown.